The internet is a great thing. It brings people together, contains nearly infinite amounts of information, and has changed the way media and music is consumed as a whole. But underneath all of the bright, distracting media that the internet hosts, exists a dark underbelly that usually isn't addressed by people, especially those on the outside looking in. Although you can quickly jump into a chat room with someone you've never spoken to before, there's a unique quality to real-life interactions that's missing from online ones. Because of this, online interactions are simultaneously the most genuine way to connect with people, and the most distant. Although you can quickly meet people, they can disappear just as quickly as you met them. Friendships of years can end in an instant. Someone may delete their account, and you'll never be able to contact them again. The abundance of information and things to do online can be great, but it can also be a curse. The fact that there's so much online that you can't bear to miss out on can leave people trapped. Forums with long, winding threads that lead down many interesting and engaging paths, massive game communities, and worlds with thousands of hours of content waiting to be completed. All of these things can be addictive. The fear of not wanting to miss out on all these special events and occasions can leave people locked in an online world. As time goes on, people can convince themselves that there's nothing for them in the real world. It doesn't accept them, so why would they try and fit in anyway? Especially if there's a large group of people online who see them for who they are. I think a lot of this can be seen in deeper online spaces, with terms like normie and newfag that criticize people who aren't as estranged from society as them. It seems like the status that you can gain online tracks inversely with the status that you gain in life. Once these temporary spaces online are gone, once the games that you spend thousands of hours in shut down, what's left? Nothing. You're left empty with nothing to show for all that time you've spent, except memories. You think to yourself, why did I spend all this time playing a game, grinding for a piece of gear when I could have spent all that time learning to play piano or code? After all, it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert at something, so I could have been an expert at something two times over. These two problems are something that seem wholly unique to those who spend most of their time online. Those who have forged this identity over the internet, but underneath, feel empty. How would I know this? Because I'm one of them. Over two and a half thousand hours clocked in a single MMO. Almost 9,000 hours on Steam. Over 1,000 hours spent on League. I'm kind of ashamed of how much time I've spent on all these. While I was at my peak of playtime, I was clocking over 100 hours a week. I had terrible grades, an empty social life outside of gaming, and was never able to finish a short film or any creative project, despite truly wanting to be creative. I don't regret the time I've spent online, the knowledge I've gained. It's made me unique. It's made me myself. I've forged many memories and friendships that I'll never forget, but something tells me I should have stopped playing while they were still fun. Because there were so many nights where gaming stopped being fun, but I still kept playing. I was left awake at 3am, scared to fall asleep because I felt as though I hadn't done enough for the day. It was painful and excruciating. It's something that for the past six years of my life, I felt entirely alone with, as though nobody else was dealing with it. I could never find resources online that weren't from some sort of out-of-touch psychologist or some organization claiming to fix unruly kids with gaming addictions that had little to no respect for kids or understanding why they liked, enjoyed, and played games in the first place. It always felt impossible to climb out of this problem, because I thought I was the only one. And then, I found you. Her music was so unique because she was someone who expressed herself through the lens of the internet, using a mix of twinkling, sparkling melodies, long, loud, and almost overwhelming synths, and the sad yet calming voice that conveyed a bitter sweetness that was hard to describe. It was something that actually made me feel heard for once, as though someone actually got it. As it turned out, I wasn't the only one who felt this way. I found people in YouTube comments who felt the same way as I did, and that made me feel heard. Yule creates a world with dramatic swells and the use of reverb heavy vocals and instrumentation that immerse you in a world that's like your own but different. Her music becomes a comforting blanket of sound that allows you to explore your own feelings. It warms your heart and makes you feel safe, but all the while exist undertones of isolation, sadness, and loneliness that permeate throughout the album. Everything is nice and comforting yet bittersweet 
It's exactly what I feel when I look back on all the friends that I've made in the past online, those that I've met who have eventually disappeared. To this day, I don't know how these people are doing these days, but I do hope they're doing well. And that's what Yule's music is to me. It's something that's paradoxically synthetic yet real. It's all about those times I spent with the guild or people that I've met online. There was always a layer of artifice on the surface, something created and synthetic, yet something more real than I've ever experienced. It's a strange thing having an intimate connection with someone you've never seen. There are so many times where people would share their deepest, darkest secret with someone that they just met. It's so easy to open up online, but it exists only there. It's fleeting, and often people disappear. Dream pop as a genre is already relatively introspective. It's something that's made to be listened to when nobody else is awake, when your brain is most active and most critical, tangled in its own thoughts. While a lot of dream pop seems to be made for lounging in your bedroom, forgetting the world, Yule is made for sitting at your computer during dark hours when nobody else is awake, when you're entirely alone with nobody to talk to. Those people online, they're cool, they're fun, but they're not always going to be there. Any day they could disappear. However, Yule's music will always be there to bring you down to earth by taking you somewhere else. It's almost like exiting a panic attack where everything seems more calm than it started. Issues are difficult, but they don't feel as insurmountable as they once were. In addition to this, a lot of her music is linked to video games and other online things. Not through any sort of explicit sampling in music, but more in terms of influences. In interviews, Yule has admitted that a lot of her influences stem from games like Final Fantasy and other RPGs, where you can be lost in worlds and spend hours on end occupying something that is fully crafted and created, yet lonely. This is a world that is occupied by you and you alone. Even her name comes from the Final Fantasy XIII-2 character, Yule. The ties to the video games are there, but not specifically in the music. It's crazy to me that without relying on lyrics or explicit words, she rather relies on the music to speak for itself. Yule is able to convey very niche, complex ideas that are rather unique to the era that we live in today. There have been plenty of artists that sound familiar to the music that she makes, and she wears all of those influences on her sleeve, but she conveys a unique attitude that not everybody will be able to understand. There is nothing that even comes close to the experience of living on the internet for such a long time. And this is something that new artists have been able to show. Yule, especially in her debut album, Serotonin 2, conveys not only the bittersweet nature of time spent on the internet, but hopes for the future as well. It's almost as if she's letting you know, personally, that things are going to be okay. That is, until the final track, where the veil slips and you see the darkness in Yule's world. The confusion, the noise, the stress, the anger. It's something that's always been there, but it just lurked under the surface. Once the distractions are gone, negativity is left with it. And although Yule gives us a peek into how those emotions play out, Sewer Slut lets us be consumed and taken in by it. Sewer Slut, who you may also know as Junko, or Sad Boy Sheldon if you're a fan of mashups, is a music artist that's hard to describe. It's another one that seems rather derivative of other artists that came before them, whether that be regular breakbeat and drum and bass, or other aggressive, sample-heavy acts. What sets them apart, however, is that they seem to convey very personal emotions while others may not have been able to. The Sewer Slut project is engaging because they use these fast, abrasive, beats that remind me of old PS2 games, which had unique aesthetics that couldn't be found elsewhere. Even in the ambient parts, they don't sound like songs made by the likes of Aphex Twin or Brian Eno. Rather, they communicate the ambiance of something like the PS2 or Dreamcast boot-up screen. At least for me, these have very complex motions attached to them. To be honest, I'm not sure why. I never owned a PS2 or a Dreamcast during those days. I only had Nintendo consoles growing up, but these sounds are familiar. It's depressing and nostalgic at the same time, which is unique to this project. Although I was born in 2001, all of these aesthetics from this era are things that have sunk into my brain. It's a specific sound that has been relegated to exclusively that point in time. 
never to be heard from again. Which is why finding this album in particular was such a shock to me. Sewer Slut, however, doesn't just take from the old. They blend in their own contemporary bassy elements with it as well. Throughout all of their projects, they maintain one core part of their aesthetic. Through the use of compressed drum sounds especially, they keep you grounded firmly in the early 2000s, where this was most popular. It is still strange to me that this is nostalgic, because I was never really part of life in the early 2000s. When I grew up though, I was surrounded by the aesthetic. Whether that be through used game cubes, PS1s, or Dreamcasts, or even strange advertisements, movies, and music I was exposed to during the time. However, the music isn't nostalgic in any sort of concrete terms, rather in this hazy, hard-to-place kind of way. Honestly, I may never know for sure why I've heard sounds like this over and over again, but it's unmistakable. Although nostalgia is an important part of the music, the other equally important thing is the way that Sewer Slut conveys depression, loneliness, and angst and confusion through their music. Instead of just paying lip service to these themes and concepts sonically, they use noise to immerse you in it. When it's 3am and you're alone, with nobody else to talk to, no friends, no significant others, no family, you're left with nothing but your thoughts. Which can be scary, it can be terrifying. At these late times at night on your computer, you're left to stew on all the complex feelings you may have been repressing for a large part of your life, whether that be through video games or other forms of entertainment. When it happens, at least for me, it feels like walls are closing in around you, and the insecurities that you have felt your whole life feel more intense than ever. And that's what existing solely online can feel like. Another theme that this artist explores that so few other artists dare to explore is the concept of sexual frustration. In album art as well as social media, Sewer Slut shows pictures that are just scuffed screen grabs from hentai and other exclusively online expressions of sexuality. Through this, they accentuate themes of isolation and loneliness. Essentially, they use this hypersexual, over-the-top imagery to show how artificial and superficial it all is. In these portrayals, it's not cool, it's not fun, it's not satisfying. It's just... sad. In short, Sewer Slot as a project is an exploration and expression of what it's like to feel disenfranchised and alone. Existing exclusively online as someone who doesn't know what their future will hold, if anything at all. Although it may be depressing for some, it makes me hopeful knowing that I'm not the only one who feels this way. Maybe, however, I'm just projecting. Maybe none of this is actually part of the intent of the artists, but it seems that many people have run away with the exact same interpretations I have, and have used this music to get themselves through times where it feels like this, where you're entirely alone and feel as though there's nothing for you except the internet. And that's the beauty of this new generation of musicians that has sprung up over the past few years. A couple of years ago, there were things that more established artists just would have never been able to understand. But now, people like me on the internet have people to relate to, and I think that's something very special and very important.